are Christianity and science typically at war? I will argue that Christianity actually helped the rise of science rather than hindered it. Let's begin with an early church father, St. Basil, who uh, was well educated at Constantinople and Athens. Uh, he had adopted much of Greek science, such as Aristotle's cosmology, which included the idea that in the center of the universe, you have four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. But Aristotle thought that the heavens were made out of a special fifth element that was incorruptible. Now, Basil actually rejected that idea because he thought that the stars were made of, well, fire or something kind of like things on earth that glow or have a flame. They have certain qualities that seem to be similar to stars. So Basil thought that there was more unity there than Aristotle. To give a little theological background to Basil, he argued that these laws of Aristotle, uh, most of which he adopted, not all, uh, that these laws were God's laws and that they weren't eternal self-sufficient principles as the pagan Greeks thought. And so these natural laws are contingent. Now that means they could have been otherwise. So Basil's theology spurred testing alternative theories in science as science began to develop in new directions in the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. This was the theological backdrop that justified the need to consider multiple possibilities and test them. St. Augustine explained that there are really two books that God wrote, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And because they're the same author, you, you're going to expect them to be consistent uh, if they're both interpreted properly or accurately. So uh, this metaphor of, the, of nature like a book helped to embolden medieval thinkers to believe that it's understandable, that is, you can read it, it's, it's intelligible, and also that ultimately there's a unity of truth and so harmony with one's Christian faith. There's a scholar by the name of Christopher Kaiser who has argued that creational theology provided three important components to science. And I think he's onto something here. First, creational theology established the idea of the comprehensibility of the world. This had both a optimistic and a pessimistic or tentative component to it. The optimistic component of this creational theology went like this. Look, if God made the world and he made our minds, then we should be able to think at least a little bit like God uh, when he was creating the world. So that gives some confidence that we can know the world as he actually made it. But this was balanced out with humility because part of creational theology teaches that humans are finite creatures, very different, of course, than God. And so our theories are going to be incomplete. A second component to the creational theology tradition is the idea of the unity of heaven and earth. And I've already hinted about this with Basil's earlier work. Psalm 102 says, the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Now, young folks probably don't really grasp this idea of clothes wearing out, but they actually do wear out eventually. And this biblical passage is making the point that the heavens are like the earth in the sense that they too wear out. They're not changelessly divine as ancient pagan Greeks like Aristotle, but. So if the heavens are like the earth in this corruptibility, well, that suggests a oneness or unity to the cosmos that was lacking in Greek thought. And this has proved extremely fruitful for the growth of science. Now, the Christian philosopher and scientist, John Philoponus, he noted that stars sometimes have distinct colors or slight tints to them. And this is reminiscent of the differing colors of fires on the earth. Not everything burns with the same color. Some fires have slightly different colors than others. And so he reasoned analogically that, well, maybe those objects in the night sky are not made of this special fifth element that Aristotle thought of, but like Basil, made out of some, something more like the fires on earth. So again, this was a, an important step forward for science, and it had its roots in theology. A third component of the creational tradition in theology is the idea of the relative autonomy of nature. 
Let's unpack this idea of the relative autonomy of nature. Autonomy carries the idea of something having its own integrity, its own sort of rules. The idea that nature has its rules or laws, uh, such as gravity, that uh, is part of this creational tradition. Creational theology suggested that the creation really is something other than God. The universe is not just an emanation from God, like many other worldviews teach, but it, it, it's actually, it has its own integrity, but it's only relative autonomy. It can't exist on its own. It, constantly depends upon God for its continued existence. And this also leaves open the possibility that God could do rare things beyond these natural laws in the natural world, and of course, these are known as miracles. Saint Basil, thinking in terms of relative autonomy of nature, argued that the planets keep moving similar to the way that a top, which is an ancient toy, by the way, uh, keeps spinning after the child's hand leaves the top. It's like the child commands the top, spin, right? And after the child lets go of the top, it continues to obey the child's command. At least that's how Basil thought of it. So analogically, well, when God causes the universe to come into existence and to have certain motions, those motions continue, and that's kind of like the nature continuing to obey the initial command of God. A little different with God because Basil also thought, like most Christians, that God continuously upholds the universe. It can't really run on its own. Again, relative autonomy, not autonomous nature. All of this is a part of the roots of the modern idea of the conservation of motion. So this theological idea of nature continuing to obey the commands of God eventually became uh, what Newton developed, and, and Descartes as well, the idea of conservation of motion. Christianity not only provided some important ideas for science and important presuppositions for science, such as the ones I just outlined, but Christianity also provided a very important institutional context for science, and that is the university. Yes, the university is a Christian idea, and about a third of the curriculum in the Middle Ages in these universities was devoted to science. So not only did the students learn science, but they were required to argue for and against some of the major theories that were under consideration at the time, such as pro and con Aristotle on various topics. This set the stage for modern science. Let's fast forward to the early modern period to see the continuing positive influence of Christianity on the development of science. And let's pick Johannes Kepler as a case study of this. Kepler, known for discovering three laws of planetary motion, rejected Aristotle's idea that the cosmos is divine and unknowable by mathematical rules. Drawing from the creationist idea of unity of heaven and earth, Kepler thought perhaps there's mathematical rules even for things happening on the earth, and maybe the heavens and the earth are unified. Kepler also used a metaphor for nature, nature as a clock. And if you think of nature as a clock, a clock, you can take it apart, look at the parts, see how they fit together. You can even think of mathematical rules for how these mechanisms work together in harmony to, to bring about a function. Well, Kepler applied this to the cosmos. The cosmos also can be understood through mathematical rules. At least that was his idea. Now, he applied this to the study of planetary motion when he inherited this mass of observations that his former boss, Tycho Brahe, had accumulated. It was great for science because Kepler got a hold of this data and realized that planets don't move in circular paths, they move in elliptical paths. And he came up with a, two additional laws as to how they move in those elliptical paths. Now, Kepler reflected on the theological underpinnings of this work, which, by the way, is still taught in astronomy textbooks, the three laws of planetary motion, and in physics textbooks. Kepler, in reflecting on the sort of theological uh, orientation that motivated and guided his work, he contrasted his theology with Aristotle's. He said that Aristotle, who did not believe that the world had been created, could not recognize mathematical design plans for the material world, because without an architect, there is no power in mathematics to make anything material. Now, what Kepler meant here is that mathematics is passive. It can't do anything. Math can't just leap off the page and make something. Uh, God can do that, though. So Kepler 
reasoned that coming to nature as a Christian with Christian theology, that he could have confidence he could discover the mathematical rules that God had instantiated into the physical world. And Kepler went on in his contrast between his view and Aristotle's view to say that trying to find mathematical rules for the physical world is acceptable to me and to all Christians since our faith holds that the world was created by God in weight, measure, and number. That is, in accordance with ideas co-eternal with him, him being God. So Kepler says here that mathematics didn't have a beginning because it always existed in the mind of God. But mathematical physical laws did have a beginning. God selected among a huge number of possibilities certain mathematical principles and then instantiated them into the physical world. Because of this theological backdrop, Kepler couldn't just deduce one way the world had to be. He realized that God could have made the world many different ways. And so he had to find out which was the most likely way that God chose. And in doing all this, Kepler was thinking God's thoughts after him. And he had confidence of this because he believed that humans are made in God's image. And so we have the ability to grasp in our mind some of the same mathematical ideas that are in the very mind of God. So testing your different mathematical ideas, which ones actually fit the data, all of this proved extremely important for the development of science. And Kepler had the confidence that this would work because of this background theology in his mind. And he was not alone in this sort of perspective. He had a colleague by the name of Galileo who also thought this way. And Galileo used that metaphor that Augustine had introduced, the idea of God's two books, the Bible and the book of nature. But Galileo added a new twist to this metaphor. He said that the book of nature, it also is written in a certain language, but it's not Hebrew or Greek, it's mathematics. Galileo went on to eventually discover and a very important physical law about free fall, how things fall on earth. And he came to this with the same kind of theology that Kepler did. And it proved extremely fruitful for science. So let me summarize some of the main ways in which Christianity helped the rise of science. Remember, creational theology provided the idea of the comprehensibility of the world, the unity of heaven and earth, and the relative autonomy of nature. Put those three together and it comes out kind of like this. We can comprehend a set of natural laws imposed by God that unify the heavens and the earth. We can understand this because we are made in his image and we can know the world with all due humility for the fact that we're finite and fallen. Christianity also supplied a number of very useful metaphors that guided the thinking of scientists. The two books metaphor, which Galileo used, tracing back at least to the time of Augustine. Another element of that metaphor is that it suggested a unity of truth that the Bible the book of, and the book of the cosmos would match once you properly interpret both books. The metaphor of nature as a clock provided confidence that, you know, just like a clock you can take apart, find the parts, see how they work. Scientists can sort of reverse engineer nature and figure out how it works, how God might have put it together. And then finally, the metaphor of how God relates to nature, the idea that he relates to it as a king relates to a kingdom. This was actually Newton's favorite metaphor for nature, and it carries some very interesting implications. It's kind of like this. Suppose you walked into a society that you totally foreign to you, and you notice that everyone's sort of obeying certain very similar rules. Well, that implies there is some rule giver. It might be a single individual, a king. It might be a group of people but you, it implies there's a unity there that traces back to some sort of law-creating uh, entity. Newton uh, thought that the laws of nature imply that there must have been a lawmaker. And because Newton believed the world was designed by God, it gave him more confidence that he could know it. This also left open the door uh, to the possibility that the king could make personal appearances or uh, engage in special acts beyond the ordinary rules of that society. Again, miracles. A lot of people have heard, well, you know, miracles, that's kind of like the opposite of science, right? But really, a miracle doesn't even make sense unless there's a backdrop of regularity against which the miracle stands out as special. And then, of course, Christianity provided an institutional home for science, the university. 
So in the end, what we find is that Christianity helped science by contributing some important ideas, methods, and institutions. So this is how Christianity played an important role in the rise of modern science. My book, Unbelievable, explains yet additional ways that this happened.